Hello, and welcome to another episode of In Conversation With. This is my fifth one so far. And uh, you can see to the side of me, we have Dark O'Murku, who is a TV presenter. He's also involved in education. He's been involved in uh, environmentalism for, for many years. And he's also going to be going on a very exciting trip to the Himalayas. But uh, before we get into all that, I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell you all a little bit, a bit about who he is. So uh, over to you, Derek, and thanks for coming on. You're welcome, Luke. Thanks for, for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Derek Murahu, born and bred in Dublin, but had a always had a strong connection to Kerry, uh, where my... Um, maternal grandparents are from. Um, so I've, I've been living here now in, in West Kerry for 18 years. Uh, and um, originally I was a, an engineer and I wasn't really happy with that kind of life. So I um, I was always interested in the mountains and hill walking. So through that, um, I my interest in that, I, I got a career in the mountains, training and climbing and guiding. And then uh, through that, then I got an interest in, in nature and ecology. So I, I kind of traversed into that kind of career. Uh, and now I, I teach all sorts of different things. So it's my it's kind of a third iteration of, of my uh, my career. Uh, firstly, an engineer, then a mountain guide or mountain leader. And then now kind of ecology and environmental and nature education. Yeah, that's interesting. I started out in IT and I moved into graphic design and eventually I moved into horticulture. I suppose, you know, this idea that you're st stuck in one career forever, that's kind of being blown to pieces. In fact, many people don't do it from choice. They're kind of forced by circumstances to, to change career. So, you know, I suppose it's a good thing that you know, the options are there that you can do it if you either have to or if you want to, you know? Yeah, and I kind I kind of was corralled into the, the engineering, even though it, it did suit me uh, to some degree, uh, but being indoors and being in, in, in a cube in an office somewhere when the sun's shining outside uh, didn't suit me at all. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, go into a different career and have you know have the interest uh have the passion for the mountains and that then led on to other other uh, career options then with the, with the nature and environmental education yeah now well the first thing i want to touch on is the environmentalism now i think we we kind of mostly met through uh, i think Ex extinction rebellion because i remember i actually started up that group and i think you came to the very first meeting and we got to know each other from there but um yeah i'm aware that you used to be involved in the green party as well and uh, you left and you know i i've been a supporter of them and i voted for them the last time round. although i have to say i now regret that decision um i don't know if you want to say much about your experience in the green party or uh you know, if, is there anything you'd like to say about that? Yeah, I guess I, 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 back, that was back in the days when I was a bit more naive about the environmental movement. And I thought, you know, I, I, a lot of things were misguided, not, not, not completely badly or anything like that. It's just that I thought like solar panels and, and wind turbines and that whole green energy movement would solve our problems. And I thought the Green Party were the, the, you know, had the, the, the right ethos and 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 um, values and and uh, policies I suppose and and I I got disillusioned with them pretty quickly I ran for election with them locally uh, you know a, a shot in the dark completely here in West Kerry uh, although things are gradually changing um you know it was, it, back then in the noughties it was still very traditional um very anti environment very anti green um. There are still, still some elements of that, but people are softening a bit to the green message now. But anyway, how um, I got completely disillusioned with the Green Party, um, you know, that they're, they're they're more the same with a tinge of green. That's that's basically how I 
how I, I classify them. Um, you know, they're still into the business as usual, um, profits for corporations, uh, you know, the, the putting those kind of the economy before people and before the environment. Um, and it's a shame because there's a lot of good people in the Green Party, a lot of the core members or the 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 ordinary membership are, are very committed and, and have the right ethos around the green message. But unfortunately, I think especially the, the leadership and the political part of the, 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 those that are in parliament um, don't have really any, any, um, you know, backbone or core values that, that really resonate with me. Now, a few of them do, and they've, they've recently got kicked out of the party um, so there is there is still a, a glimmer of hope for the green, green party but i'm really not interested in in that and i've lost my faith in politics in general uh, i've got quite cynical about the whole uh, sham i suppose i could call it that i i know it's it's the best we have and there's always that argument of people well you know um you know it's it's better than the alternative of of you know, whatever that might be, uh, dictatorship, communism, you know, fascism and all that crack. And it is. But I think as a species, we deserve better than what we have at the moment and we can come up with better. It's just that we're stuck in this old way of thinking that democracy is the best of the bad lot or that democracy serves as well. It, it really doesn't. And along with that, I don't think it really is true democracy. You know, I mean, how many people in Ireland vote nowadays? Um and, you know, generally that's the voting process is most people's, uh, the sum total of most people's interaction with the system, you know, and that, that I, I don't believe is, is a proper democracy. So, you know, there's, there's, there's lots in there. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I must say, I, I, I tend to agree about the state of politics generally, not just in Ireland, but all across the world that uh, really people are just enfranchised. And as the way I, I made a video about this, about, you know, the, the pyramid structure as opposed to a spherical structure. And um, when you have a pyramid, ordinary people have virtually no say. If you have a more grassroots uh, spherical structure, something that's maybe you have to have a series of smaller structures, perhaps rather than one massive one in order for it to work and actually give people a real bit of input. Because, like, yeah, once every four or five years, you get a vote. And then these people just disappear and go off and do whatever they want. And it's the same everywhere where you have this system of elections every four or five years, I think. And so I think it's it's a worldwide thing myself. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, you know, I, I still believe in, in trying to to um engage with that possibly on some level. For for some people that that's that's a um the right way to go about things and I, I i believe we should be plugging away at all levels but at the moment i'm i'm more about like trying to like empower myself first of all to 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 make good decisions for myself and then also to uh, empower the community to do things for themselves rather than waiting for the government to do it and trusting the government as well because i don't trust the government uh, at all and um, you know they're you know the whole system's too caught up in 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 big business and um, you know that's and and also serving the economy and and in the end what is the economy the economy is this beast that 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 um you know keeps things chugging along and, and makes a lot of, some people wealthy and um you know that the foot soldiers or the, the peasants or whatever you want to call them are just you know slaving away um you know, just for the benefit of the few, and all, and also with the with the negative consequences that we're seeing nowadays, in, in terms of lots of things like our, you know, social systems are are, you know, on the brink of breaking down, or or even our our, you know, health system is in chaos. You know, the education system isn't great either. You know, there, there's a lot of problems in society, homelessness, all that crack. Um, talking crack like um you know drug addictions and the, the the poor state of of the health system in terms of people um relying on medication rather than preventative medicine and being healthy in the first place you know there's you can poke so many holes in in, in our system and i know there's you know it's a, it's a big mess that you, how can you fix it all you, you can't fix it all in one go but i think 
at the core of it is that we're we're driven by the wrong set of values or or um I I don't know what what it is that we 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 want the 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 core of what we are we're looking for is is wrong I think it's it's you know people we always put this thing of financial gain at the front and really what what we should really include is um gain for everything and everyone and how can we be fair and how can we you know treat each other well and how can we treat the earth well as well so you know bring in a bit of the principles of of uh, permaculture in there mm. um or just common sense yeah well um you mentioned the word community which is something i know you're involved in so you're kind of really involved in two communities really because you know there's we live we both live in the gale tut your gale gore whereas i've got like very small level of irish so you know i'm aware you've been involved in community projects um some of which would be uh, a scale group for the schools and also you've you've been involved in uh making some tv programs for tg car uh for people that don't know tg car is the uh, irish language tv uh station here and there's also a radio station called radio miguel uh Gale Talk, doesn't it and uh yeah, I think yeah, the two the two programs you've done they're both sort of about wilderness and about one was specifically I think about the COVID one, wasn't it? That was uh, Cork and Nadir, wasn't it? That done all during the lockdowns. I think is that my yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. So first of all, I, I suppose Irish the Irish language is a big part of my life. I was I was brought up with Irish in Dublin, which is kind of a bit unusual especially back then the 80s not many people would have been doing it and my first experience of English would have been out in the street with other kids so um I was brought up in an Irish household and now one of the one of my the reasons for moving here to West Kerry was because of the Irish and Irish is a big part of my daily life through you know my family my mum my brother and my uh, nephew but also a lot of my friends and then my work so as you mentioned, I work a lot in the local schools. I work a lot with or local organizations in adult education as well. And uh, currently I'm doing a lot of work with trainee teachers who are down here to learn Irish and practice their Irish. But yet also, um, I don't know, through, I suppose, through my mountaineering, I and I think the political, my my when I dip my toe into the political scene, um, radio, the local radio, the the kind of became aware of me so um i think i i probably did well enough in interviews when i was talking about the 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 the, the election when i was running for election and um, that then they they heard that i was involved in mountaineering so they brought me in for to talk about mountaineering items and then it spread from that to to other issues um anything regarding the environment uh in general and now more recently i've been doing a, a regular piece on growing uh, vegetables so um and i guess that the way it works is a small world i mean ireland is a small country you know you, there's whatever three degrees of separation or something like that or five degrees of separation whatever it is um and the irish language scene is even smaller still so word spreads and you know the um so someone heard of me in the tv uh, scene so i got asked to do a program called Dulla Beyond, which was all mm. about uh, foraging. Um, and that was a great, great um, program to, to make. It was, you know, it was all shot out, outdoors and got to travel around Ireland uh, foraging for food. There was two was of you, great. wasn't there um, a fisherman and then as well? That. There was a fisherman guy did that with you, wasn't there? Yeah. So also, yeah. So I teamed up. Yeah. I te yeah. Yeah, there's a guy from uh, up in County Down, uh, um, Frank McKenna. So they paired us up. We teamed up together. I guess we we, we ended up doing the the what you call it that pro test shoot. Um, they were just auditioning, and we just hit it off on 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 camera that day. So they they chose the two of us, and then they turned it into this thing where we started in his backyard up in uh, County Down, the Morns. And we traveled across the country down to here, down to Kerry, foraging along the way. And we finished off down here. We did a, 
uh, kind of a, a party where we we put on a, a big spread of wild food and uh, people came along and had had a bit of food and a bit of crack and we made some wild wild wine as well in, in a kind of replica full of fear um, so that was that was all a bit of crack um you know i i i was experienced in foraging and knew uh, a bit but you know i've come a long way since then that was over 10 years ago um so i've come a long way in my foraging knowledge and skills since then so i was kind of winging it a bit back then uh but also i had it had a good enough basis but frank there along alongside he had a good basis as well with plants and especially he was a keen fisherman so um he was there catching the fish he taught me how to fly fish and of course when when push came to shove he managed to to catch the the goods when we needed it uh so it was nice to have that uh mix and also the mix of irish as well because he has northern irish irish and uh sometimes a bit i find it difficult to understand that accent but uh it was nice to have that the the, the contrasting accents or um gloss uh um not accent yeah accents or, or dialects i suppose mm -hmm. um but anyway since since that program then i've been doing other bits and pieces um gary gloss was a program about growing vegetables so i was on that a few times as just a guest and i was on a couple of other programs as well and then i got a call up um close soon after the, the lockdowns happened in in they happened in March 2020. So I got a call in April 2020 to uh, take part in this program that was based on the whole premise that nature was benefiting from the lockdown. And, um, you know, like like with all TV, there's a couple of things going on there with that TV program. Um, I, I guess I went into it a bit innocently and also thinking that, you know, whatever... The director put us in and what scenario he put us in and what I said or interviewed would be what would come out in the program. But ultimately, the the editor is the person who who really has a lot of control. The commissioning editor has a lot of control on how the program goes. So it's it's a funny one. Unless you make a TV program yourself, you, you you're leaving it in the in the in the control of other people. So you have to have a bit of faith that it will turn out the way somehow the way you want it. But one of the main things with that program was that the premise was that nature was benefiting from the lockdown. And certainly it did to some degrees, but there was lots of um, small things that were um, impacting nature during lockdown. So a lot of people got away with doing, you know, draining bogs where, in protected areas where they shouldn't have been because, you know, they were doing things under the radar or there was a lot of visitors to um corners of national parks and they were camping while camping and maybe staying there for weeks on end and leaving lots of rubbish so there was those kind of little niggly things but the main thing about the lockdown was that um rather than nature bev benefiting in a huge way that the the main destroyer of nature continued during the lockdown and that's far farming modern industrial uh intensive agriculture was you know was trucking on right as it uh, as it did before the lockdown it was it was full steam ahead during the lockdown so for me that's the biggest destructive force of nature in in ireland anyway yeah well i think we do need to change our farming practices and going back to what you said about foraging i'm, I'm in two minds myself because i can see that foraging is a good idea but the one problem is is everyone gets in on the idea then you're into a big problem it can only work when people do it in the correct way like I always would say, like, you know, take leaves off of three different plants. And if there's one plant on its own, don't take anything off it. And people go out foraging and they're like, oh, let's have some wild garlic and this. And they end up actually causing more destruction in their, you know, they're enthusiastic, which is good. But, you know, the thing is, that you have to do it the right way. I think in a way you'd be nearly better off trying to recreate these sort of wild zones in your own place if you can rather than actually going and just taking from from the wild areas because if enough people do it it's it's ruined you know it's like you get national parks where there's been so many people doing things like um biking and quad biking and walking that you've got like massive hill erosion in some 
cases because it's so popular. Uh, it, it's very popularity ends up causing a disaster. Yeah, that's that's the, you know in the, in the age of Instagram and all that, it's just that's you know amplified that whole issue of popularity and and bringing people to places. But it was always an issue, you know, that beach, the the famous full moon beach party in in Thailand, drawing lots of people in. The place is completely destroyed, and it's mm. it's it's own, the popularity of it has ruined the fabric that attracted people to it in the first place, and. You know, going back to what you're saying there about foraging, like foraging is that double-edged sword. And I, I'm I'm a foraging teacher and I do go out, I, I run courses and workshop in foraging. And um, you know, you could you could take this approach of, you know, okay, let's let's leave wild nature to itself and let's like, you know, cordon it off and hands off and not let people go near it because it is that fragile and um it is at risk of being destroyed. Um, but I, I take it a different stance on that. And I, I hope through through allowing people to have a connection with nature and, um, you know, engage with it, interact with it and build some sort of relationship with it through foraging or through any other activity that, that I might teach. And um, the, the aim is that then people will value it more because they and they will know it more. You know, they they will they will. Uh, it's not this thing that's you know nature is out over there and you know, whatever they don't know it, they don't interact with it, don't connect with it. So by doing these activities such as foraging responsibly, that that you would hope or I hope that people will love nature more and see the value of it and then hope to promote it some somehow, um, you know either through doing having a less destructive or negative lifestyle or through campaigning or through um you know creating habitat somewhere be it in their back garden or some uh, public space locally so um mm. i think that's a, that's a really important part of foraging and other nature connection activities is that that getting to know it and and therefore valuing it and needing it somehow like having it uh, we all need nature um, and some people don't know that we need it. You know, people don't even realize that, you know, where do we get all our, our, our food from? Where do we get, you know, soil fertility from? You know, certainly not from a, a bag of fertilizer, you know. Nature provides us with all the, the fer fertility in the soil that, that creates our food. You know, oxygen, clean air, water, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, so allowing people to discover um, the importance of nature, the beauty of nature, the amazement of nature, through doing various activities and um, so you know there is that case where people do go out um, and ignorantly or otherwise um, you know maybe cause a bit of damage and take too much so trying to always get people to to respect nature and to um, only take if there's if there's uh, abundance there already and remembering that nature needs enough for itself to survive, but also there's, you know, leaving enough for others to, to enjoy as well. So there is that striking that fine balance while, while foraging. But the ultimate hope is that through connecting people with nature, that we will have more of these habitats um, and that, you know, somehow uh, a culture change will happen and a mind, mindset shift will happen because currently in Ireland, um, there isn't that love or real urgency or need to protect nature amongst the general population. There, you know, people are waking up to it, but they somehow don't know yet how and and why and and all this stuff. So, um, I think it's important work anyway. Yeah, I agree. And I look, what I, what you've just said makes a lot of sense. And you know, it's easy to forget. I mean, I I was lucky. I grew up in the middle of nowhere there where there was a farm right next door. I used to go running off down and through the village, down into a quarry, all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, go all over the countryside and just have to be home at six o'clock for dinner. And they didn't know where I'd gone. And I'd come back covered in muck and sometimes ripped clothes, God knows what. So, you know, I was familiar with, you know, all, all the you know, animals that you see uh, around and, you know, just getting dirty, whatever. And it's easy to forget that some people, you know, never even seen a cow in their, their whole life. And, uh, you know, you're right about the experiencing, like if you look at a thousand pictures of a sunrise, it's not 
ever going to be the same as actually going and watching the sunrise, uh, standing on the beach and watching it come up is a very amazing experience. So, you know, photo is lovely, but it's, it, there's no equality between the two. They're completely, you know, one is a sort of just a, a, a two dimensional poor imitation of the other, isn't it? So I totally get what you're saying about hands on experience of actually being in nature immersed in it makes it's transformative. Whereas just reading a book about nature is not, you know, mm. we're getting towards the end of our time. So I wanted to ask you a bit about the Himalayan trip you have coming up. So uh, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, uh, well, I suppose all my life I've been into hill walking and I've got my parents to thank for that because growing up in the suburbs of Dublin, they used to bring us up to the Dublin mountains and up to the Wicklow Hills and um, also down in Kerry. So um, I've always been, I had a love of being in the mountains and I, I, as I said earlier on, I transferred from my career in, in engineering to mountaineering. And I, you know, in that that respect, I, I had the, the time of my life working in the mountains. And um, I was always drawn to the kind of the unusual side of mountaineering or the more exploratory, exploratory side of mountaineering. Um, I never really attracted to going to the really busy places like Kilimanjaro or even Everest, like it's just just too busy, you know, for me. Um, so back in uh, 2008, I went on a similar trip to India in the Indian Him Himalayas to climb an unclimbed peak. And uh, that all went really well. And it was an amazing uh, once in a lifetime experience, uh, hopefully now to re be repeated. So um, I had a bit of a, a, a a break from mountaineering because of an injury uh, and that's why that's one of the reasons like, why I kind of went into the ecology side of things and, and nature and environmental education um, but over the years now I've been getting back into the mountaineering and doing a bit more and um, one of my my friends who I went on that climbing trip with back in 2008 he's he's always been ringing me up every few years seeing if I'm I'm up for another expedition so um Finally, uh, probably a year and a half ago or two years, I said, ah, yeah, sure, I'll give it a go again now. Um, so this year I went to Scotland in the winter just to see how I was, if my body would would hold up to the to the rigours of, of um, you know, strenuous mountaineering with, you know, ice axes and crampons and heavy backpack and long days and things like that. So all was fine. So now I'm, I'm heading off to the Indian Himalaya again, similar area to where we were before, to climb a, a peak that that hasn't been climbed before so uh, it's very exciting it's it's an amazing experience to to undertake such a trip it takes a, um, a good chunk of time so we'll be in the we'll like the lads the two lads i'm going with they'll have to take six weeks off work and family and all that kind of crack um we'll be five weeks in the mountains uh away from civilization so that in itself is an amazing experience um you know can be quite lonely can be quite harsh um you know certainly you're 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 at the at the whims of of the weather and and the, the you know the landscape out there so that really influences you a lot out there um so if 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 you're not mentally prepared it can be very very tough uh, also you need to be physically prepared because this kind of mountaineering is a, a lot of uh, a lot of um hard graft and and just um discomfort and um hardship i suppose now i'm not i'm not really selling it but there's a lot in that of you know going through this these difficulties and the physical challenges and the you know the the lack of oxygen at high altitude mountaineering and the just the sheer carrying a heavy pack and you know long days and um, and through that some sort of pleasure or or reward comes you know through that hard work and, and graft and you know you might reach the top you might not reach the top and sure you know it's it's like the the old cliche is the journey that counts so um the last time it was just an amazing experience to reach the top of the mountain that we had uh, aimed for um and it was great to do it as a team together um now you know who knows it's it's always in the balance you never know there could be something simple that might not allow us to to make it to the top of the mountain that we want to climb 
So it's all a big unknown. Uh, but along with the the aim of climbing that peak, we'll, we're going to be doing a bit of exploration, a bit of trekking over high passes. Um, but also I'm going to be traveling there overland. Initially, I'd hoped to go by motorbike, but um, that's all in the bin now because um, I couldn't get my my license in time. I'd done the, the training and got, got the bike and logged the hours. But unfortunately, um, there's a Back, backlog with the the license uh, process here in Ireland so uh, I'm going now um via every sort of other mode of transport except air so I'm going to be getting trains boats buses rickshaws <laughs> tuk-tuks whatever whatever it takes I'll be hitching as well so um every sort of mode of transport uh, I'll be traveling there down through Europe uh, Greece across Turkey Iran Pakistan and into India and I'll be traveling home the same way as well. So it's that yeah. that in itself is going to be a, a big trip as well. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I remember years ago watching uh, Michael Palin's journeys by train. I think he did the whole of Russia by train and he went to Mongolia as well, I think. And uh, yeah, I thought myself, it's kind of a, an interesting way to travel. It's, um, you know, okay that's part of the whole trip is is getting there in a much slower way rather than so just flying in you're there in a few hours and bang it starts from there but with that kind of travel it's the you know it's part of the trip itself isn't it yeah. and uh yeah i one of the things i'd love to do it's not a very popular thing to say at the moment but i really, really would love to go to russia or maybe travel from st petersburg right across to the other side which brings you almost to, to Japan, which is another country that I'd love to visit. So, um, you know, maybe when all this is over and there's no more kind of conflict going on, I might get a chance to do that in the future. And um, I think I might have to wait a little while though for that one. But uh, it sounds very, yeah. very exciting what you're doing. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, I hope you'll make some kind of record of your, of your trip, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe it might be another TV program out of that. Or even yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, like I, I I'm kind of bit limited with time. So, you know, making making a, a video of it or something like that would 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 be too long. I, I yeah. Um, but I will write take notes. You know, I'll have a journal. I'll take plenty of photos and stuff like that. So I will have an account of it. And if something comes of it, if if I have you know, if I feel inspired to write about it, um, I'll do that. I mean, plenty of people have done it before, so it's nothing, nothing exceptional. But, um, you know, it, dep it depends on the experiences along the way, and that's, you know, that's in the lap of the gods. Uh, you know, who knows what might happen along the way? I might meet really interesting people and have great, a great experience. Or it could be quite a dull, ordinary journey over relatively speaking of course because you know it's going to be exciting anyway but um yeah we'll, we'll see how it goes um but i'm i'm really grateful for the, the 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 slow travel option because well relatively slow compared to walking or horseback um because it, it, it makes a huge difference to the experience of being in a country like i, I don't like the idea like you say being parachuted in by a plane and within a matter of hours you're you're gone from one world to another world i i like to experience the the landscape and the the subtle changes along the way and um, that for me is real travel i i don't like i never like that experience of being dropped in somewhere suddenly um and you know of course the the journey itself is very rich from the people you meet um, i've done quite a lot of long distance hitchhiking trips as part of my kind of environmentalism uh, I've hitched a good few times up to Finland in winter. I've hitched to Portugal as well in winter as well from Ireland. Um, all very kind of arduous and long journeys, but amazing because of the people you meet and the the, the stories you have from it. Like, um, and then the the way you get to know a landscape and a country from traveling through it um, at a slower pace than than an airplane. Yeah, but one last thing came to my mind is like I'd imagine with your You've been involved in the Leave Nothing Behind this Irish website. I imagine when you go there, you won't be leaving anything behind, like which is often a problem. I've heard that that Everest is covered in crap from expeditions. And they actually, I think the Nepalese government organized some kind of cleanup to go and 
collect all the crap, uh, you know, left over bits of tent or whatever that that all these climbers had left over a period of what 30, 40 years. Um, so yeah, I'd imagine you you won't be leaving all that behind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a funny thing. Like people have this impression about mountaineers that they're all eco friendly. Well, that's that's a lot of rubbish. Like you know, it's 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 disgraceful. Some of the places I've visited, I've worked in in um, in Kyrgyzstan in the mountains there, and the place was a an unholy mess. It was just like canisters of gas thrown all over the place. You know, people just latrines like shitting all over the place. No oh. no uh, regard for environmental or or personal hygiene or health or other people like you know so um yeah we we will be operating on that basis you know everything that comes in with us goes out again um you know um we'll be we'll be as mindful as we can do but of course you know by being on this earth we all we all have an impact and mm -hmm. the journey itself is going to be quite impactful so you know i'm not disregarding that i'm not putting myself up on a platform you know it's it is it is what it is uh, i'm just trying to do live my life on a on a mindful or you know aware way and try and reduce my impacts as much as i can um in an aware way you know that that's that's what i'm doing you know so yeah well it's, uh, it's a funny thing you're right i mean just by getting out of bed you probably kill like thousands of bacteria you know, so, you know, everything we do has some impact, but as you're right, being aware of our impact and trying to minimize it. Um, you know, I think one of the problems in the modern world is so much of the stuff is hidden, you know, especially the kind of industrial corporate world. They like to hide the impact that things have. And, that you know, that would be something for another conversation. But uh, we're out of time, I'm afraid, but uh, thank you very much for coming on. It's been fascinating listening to you and uh, best of luck with your trip. And I hope, uh, hope it all goes really well for you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks a million, Luke. It was a pleasure. Thanks a million. Bye.